So last time, we derived um, several important quantities for an ideal Fermi gas, um, degenerate Fermi gas. That means very close to its ground state. We derived um, the energy. Oh, I should... of the different states. So here we have an X and Y. And of course, this was three dimensional. So we had the usual suspects. The uh, energy of the different states, we saw that in the ground state, they form a sphere because it is the minimum energy state that allows the different particles to be in different quantum states. From that, we derive the ground state uh, energy, which was three fifths of uh, the number of particles times the Fermi energy we derive the Fermi energy, which is this, and over here we'll have, um, actually there was a confusion here with uh, N the concentration and N the Fermi radius. So this one is the, the concentration. And we also derived the density of states. And we saw that for a, um, a spherical configuration in K space. Your states goes as e to the one half. And for general um, metals, this shape is different. For, as we will see today, for simple metals like you know, lithium, lithium, potassium, uh, sodium, all the ones on the left side of your periodic table, and for the noble metals, uh, copper, silver, and gold, this looks uh, the electronic density of states looks a lot like this. Um, maybe later in solid state or something, you will learn that uh, this is the shape of the um, S electrons that are spherical. And so that's why the simple metals and the noble metals uh, have densities of states that look like that. And we saw that when we multiply times the Fermi Dirac distribution, at some finite temperature, and so this width is going to be proportional to the temperature tau, and so the uh, number of states that are occupied is going to look, yes, maybe kind of like this. So these states will be unoccupied. These ones will be occupied. The last question that I asked that, that we were discussing is whether the heat capacity of a metallic system of a free electron gas is uh, higher or lower or equal than the heat capacity of an ideal gas. And the answer is that it's much lower because A regular freedom translational is going to be three halves
and hence contribute to the heat capacity. So we are going to derive that heat capacity today. Um, the math is not as simple. This is one of the great successes. This whole theory. So it can predict the heat capacity of metals at low temperature, as we'll see. So remember that the definition of the heat capacity is derivative of the energy with respect to tau. So let's focus on this quantity first, the change in the energy. So the change in the energy is going to be, how we can define it this way, has the energy at temperature tau, minus the energy at temperature zero. And the energy at temperature zero, we derived it. Last time is just U null, okay? So one of the equations that we derive was 7.23 that said that Um, Q naught is equal to the integral from zero to infinity of the E, E that gives state Fermi energy, I mean, uh, Fermi Dirac distribution, which is E, tau, and mu. So, at zero temperature, the chemical potential is equal to the Fermi energy, right? And we know how this distribution looks like. It's gonna be one everywhere. Uh, if the energy is less than the Fermi energy and zero, if, uh, sorry, one, ah, one, if, and zero, if the energy is, so that means that 
uh, we can change this to the integral from zero to the Fermi energy. And just forget about this one. Okay, so that is the energy of the ground state. So that means that delta u, as I'm going to put it over here, zero to infinity, the e, e density of state in the whole thing for the Fermi Dirac distribution, but we know that it's also a an arbitrary temperature and we can move or subtract the energy of the ground. Yes, you can see that. And this is equation 7.24. So look at equation 7.24. That equation says that this change in energy is equal to integral from zero from Fermi energy to infinity dE e minus ef and then Fermi Dirac and density of states minus uh, the integral uh, this one is from zero to infinity zero to infinity zero to Fermi energy the E E minus uh, this one is EF minus E one minus F E density of state. So we um, expand this equation. So I'm going to draw a line over here. Uh, we will see that this is equal to integral this is EF. Okay, so this is one not really one half, but it's one side of the integral, and this is the other side of the integral. Okay, so then this is EF to infinity, the E, E, F E, density of states, which is a function of E. And I'm going to write the other one. This one is the uh, EF. So this one over here. F E. And then down here, I'm going to write uh, this one. So 
So all of these are going to go from zero to the Fermi energy. some of them. So I'm going to call this one I'm going to call Roman numeral one. And this one also. Roman numeral one. So if you put them together, you, know, you get the whole thing from zero to infinity. And this one over here is this guy over here and this one I'm going to the numeral along with this one think from zero to infinity um, this is the Fermi energy so constant. So you will actually take it out of the integral. We have DE drag. And this one I'm going to call Roman numeral three. Okay, so we see that it's the same thing that we have up there. So If we put the ones, the Roman numeral ones together, we get that one. And Roman numeral two is minus zero to infinity DE Fermi energy, Fermi Dirac density of states. All right, so now um, remember we drive this equation last time also that the number of particles n is the integral from zero to infinity of e of state which is the function of e this is the general and recovering in the ground state, just like we did for the energy, this is equal to zero, uh, integral from zero to the Fermi energy. The e. e. So these are just the, this, this will be the zeroth moment, right? That we were dealing with at the beginning of the term. The energy is the first moment you know, of the, um, the energy. And so if we multiply this 
number of particles by the Fermi energy, we can just put that inside. To make it easier to see the connection. So you can see that um, all times the it's two. And so two, um, we have the negative in here. One is this guy over here. This is three. So that means that we can, so two and three cancel out, which is convenient. And this is what we had at the beginning. I don't know who's drilling. All right. So equation 7.27 includes conservation of particles, which I guess is a fact of life in uh, uh, with fermions. You cannot destroy or create fermions out of nothing. So then if we look, Uh, equation 7.27 have delta u integral from zero, sorry, from Fermi energy to infinity. has some uh, insight. So this part over here, if we you know, just assume that the density of states is just like the Fermi energy, sorry, the Fermi Dirac distribution, then the first term looks like this. So this is the Fermi energy. Uh, this is one half. So at some finite temperature, this integral is this part over here.
direct distribution. So this part here is going to be zero. And when this part is zero, be one. So and of the other side is going to be the Fermi energy. Energy number of particles is going to be one. So you will have some um, small, but the value over here. So this is one half, let's say. So that function is going to look like that. This is zero to Fermi energy. So it's going to be this part. See that. So every temperature is low compared to um, the energy of five electrons in Fermi gas, fermions in a Fermi gas. So these two are going to be uh, symmetric, going to be equal. So you have your conservation of particles in that equation. And so uh, this part of the equation gives you the energy. needed to move uh, fermions I'm sorry that I use you know, fermion and electron kind of interchangeably electrons are of course the most common fermions so energy needed to move fermions um, from the Fermi energy uh, to energy above the Fermi energy. So you need this to happen first. You need at least some electrons to move above the, the Fermi energy. And so that will allow some of the electrons over here to move up also. But you know, they can only occupy of the spaces that are not occupied anymore by the electrons that move. So the second part is the energy. Beyond. Less than the Fermi energy. Yeah. Right, so when you start to increase the temperature, what's going to happen to the shape of the Fermi direct distribution? Any idea? Alexis. Come on, guys. I'm sorry, I'm not sure. What happens to the Fermi Dirac distribution when you start to increase the temperature? Uh, what do you mean? So this is zero, this is one, 
This is the energy. So as you increase the temperature, um, these functions start to look more like this, right? So initially it's just a square, and then you start to get round edges, and then it becomes more like a function. We have seen this several times. A very high limit. Both Einstein. several times okay. when you increase the temperature um, the distribution starts to look smoother more not like a just a step function anymore you have conservation of particles so the particles that were here moved over here uh, or the particles that were over here moved over here and so on what we see over here. Okay. So as you increase temperature, you allow some fermions. Maybe this one will be All right. Maybe you'll have to watch this lecture again. So Let's look at a metal, simple metal. Let's look at potassium. Potassium, two S's. Okay, so I mentioned that metals, simple metals, the alkali metals, so you know, like lithium, uh, sodium, potassium. Um, I remember what else is here, like rubidium, cesium. Maybe I'm missing one. So this uh, part of the uh, periodic table, you know, they have only one electron. So up here you will have hydrogen, hydrogen, helium on the other side, lithium, beryllium, and then you have a space, uh, sodium. I don't know, there's calcium somewhere in here, no? So uh, these guys over here have one electron in their outer shell. And that electron is an S electron, which it has a spherical shape. Uh, the other ones, you know, when you start filling this column over here, uh, I don't remember, they have like, um, Zirconium, vanadium, mm. titanium, maybe manganese. Um, At some point, you get to iron, uh, cobalt, nickel. I think after nickel, you have a uh, copper. And then in the copper column, you have silver and gold. So over here you feel the D shell, which is what comes after the S shell. And so these guys over here, the noble metals, they also have one electron in the outer shell, and that electron looks like a sphere. Okay. So this is a pretty good model of uh, metals. And not a horrible model of the rest, actually. So I looked up the um, the molar volume of potassium. It is forty-five 
point ninety four centimeters cubed. So one mole per forty six centimeters cubed. So you know, just using that um, information, we can calculate the Fermi energy of potassium. So it's going to be h bar squared divided by two m. What 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 is the mass that we're looking at here? If we want to get the Fermi energy of the free electron gas in potassium, what is this mass? Is it the mass of the electron? Awesome. Yes, the mass of the electron. And then uh, in here we have the three pi squared um, n divided by v to the two thirds. So um, I use um, SI units. So uh, joules times second over here for H bar and kilograms for the mass of the electron. Uh, the numbers are like, you know, the crazy exponents. So typically uh, you use electron volts instead of joules um, but you know either either will work um, a lot of you made mistakes on the test not a lot but you know very decent number uh, so remember that h bar is h divided by 2 pi so a lot of you guys use the value for h instead of um, h bar so anyways uh, this is going to be 1.05 times 10 to the negative 34 joules per second. It's going to be squared. Uh, this is twice the mass of the electron. You guys remember the mass of the electron? Yeah, call, call 911, 9.11 times 10 to the negative. Anyways, um, here we just have the three pi squared n is the number of particles in one mole. 6.022 divided by the volume, so one that in meters cubed. Extend to the negative six meters cubed. Um, so, you know, we put everything in the calculator. The Fermi energy comes out to be, um, so the units over here, you know, this is kilogram, meter squared per second squared, and it's squared, so this is kilogram squared, meters to the fourth, second squared and then we have another second squared over here so i guess this is second squared and then we have a kilogram over here so we can get rid of that squared and then over here Meters over here, 
and it gets in joule. So that's good because it's an energy, the Fermi energy. And it is uh, 3.22 times 10 to the negative 19 joules. Okay. The Fermi energy is the same as the Fermi temperature. It's just a, a name. Remember that temperature, or I guess fundamental temperature. Fundamental temperature is just an energy. This is not the energy of the electrons or of the system. This is the energy of the most energetic fermion in the electron in the fermion gas. So in conventional units, temperature is um, KB, wait, uh, no, fundamental temperature is KB times the conventional temperature. Conventional temperature is fundamental divided by Boltzmann's constant. So if we divide this one by Boltzmann's constant, which is 1.38 times 10 to the negative 23 uh, joules per Kelvin. So we cancel out the joules and we're going to get something in Kelvin. The Fermi temperature. Did I put it? So for potassium, it is uh, 23,331. So tell me, what does the temperature mean? We know that the Fermi energy is the energy of the most energetic fermion in the uh, in the gas. We could also get the energy, state energy of the state of the system is going to be times the number of particles Fermi energy. What else does it tell us? What is the temperature? What is room temperature? What is the temperature in your room right now? So if we do the temperature, it's called all room temperature. It's about, you know, one percent. So the temperature of the system, you know, of uh, if you're holding a pen, you know, with some metal parts in it, you know, the metal uh, in the pen, so the temperature was about, was about 200 K. Uh, the, the most energetic electron in that metal has about 30,000 K. Um, why does it burn you? Well, it's only, well, first the electrons cannot escape, they're trapped. 
uh, but also uh, only a few of them have that temperature. Uh, so when we were looking at changes with temperature. Maybe it's going to look like this. So there's a figure, figure 7.5. You can tell. The Fermi direct distribution for several temperatures. So one looks like times 10 to the 2, uh, the, the change is very perceptible. Um, zero Kelvin. This is Deviation is pretty significant. If you're not, you know, in a regular metal, we're just we're two orders of magnitude below. We're very close to the zero Kelvin. And so what this shows you is that electrons in a metal are in their ground state. So they are a degenerate and hence you know, quantum uh, ideal, pretty close to ideal Fermi gas. And that's pretty, pretty incredible, I think. You can hold the metal in your hand. Some electrons have this temperature. Anyways, okay, so what we're gonna do now to get the heat capacity So the heat capacity you know, is du over d tau. If you look at oh, over here, if you look at equation seven point twenty seven again, you will see that the only terms that have a well, the only term in the whole equation that depends on the temperature is the Fermi Dirac distribution. The density of states is um, independent of the temperature, and you know, at least in this model, um, well, the energy is just dependent on the energy, and so the only thing that depends potentially on the temperature is the Fermi Dirac distribution. 
So the terms that have a Fermi Dirac uh, are the ones that I called one and two. Roman numerals one and two. So then this derivative is going to be, you know, the derivative with respect to tau of those two terms. So it was integral from zero to infinity dE e, e density of states, which is a function of the energy and from the rack distribution minus integral from zero to infinity. Out if we want it. States and Fermi Dirac distribution. You know that Fermi Dirac depends on the. So the electronic heat capacity, this is, or fermionic, I guess you can call it. The electronic heat capacity is um, integral from zero to infinity, dE, E minus EF. Um, derivative with respect to the derivative of the Fermi Dirac distribution with respect to tau and then the density of states. So, direct distribution, like this, as you start to increase the temperature, if you increase it a little more, then it looks like this. That's what you're looking for, right? This is the DF d tau. Relatively low temperature. So that we saw that. The um, small the the ring of the energy is going to be small. So it's going to be kind of over here only. And so that a very good approximation. We can, well, this is going to be zero. It's not changing. This is going to be zero also. And so we can call this the Fermi energy and take it outside of the integral. That simplifies things a little bit. So this is the electronic heat capacity. All right. So this is equation 7.28. Um, well, actually, when you take it out, it's 7.29. When you take the uh, density of state out. Okay. So this integral, whatever you do to it, it's ugly. So I, I spent way too much time looking at it. So you know, there's uh, some reasoning in the book. I'm going to show you different way to do it. I was you know, looking at, although again, I don't think it's particularly more um, transparent than what. But, uh, so I gave you and give it to you, we derived it. We saw that the uh, Fermi energy, I mean, Fermi direct distribution.
is equal to one half of one minus tang of minus EF divided by two tau. So, you know, the first part is not that bad. Derivative of the Fermi direct distribution with respect to tau is just a derivative with respect to tau. Uh, the first part is a constant, so we don't care about it. So we have the minus one half tang e minus ef over two tau, and you know, uh, simply enough, the derivative to the derivative of tang squared. So this is going to be minus one half sec squared e minus ef over two tau and then times the right hand side. So negative. Squared. Here and negative here, we can get rid of the negatives. And so the derivative of the Fermi Dirac distribution with respect to tau is E minus EF divided by four tau squared. We have the two over here. Here and the two over here, the tau squared, and it's just the sec squared of E minus EF divided by two tau. Okay, so we have the squared of the hyperbolic uh, secant, and so this is equal to. You know, one bolic derivative is not horrible, um, but once you put it inside of the integral, it gets a little unruly. So the electronic heat capacity is the density of states evaluated at the Fermi level uh, integral from minus infinity to infinity. You have to change the limit of integration because the other one was from zero to infinity. This one is from negative infinity to infinity because this one focused on uh, this point. Fermi energy. We have to integrate on both sides. I was looking at it, it converges very quickly. So then this will be DE um, E minus EF. And then we have the one that we initially had inside of the integral. And now we have this other one. So E minus EF uh, divided by four tau squared, and then you have dex squared of E minus EF. And this one, we can put the square over here. So maybe four tau squared. And we have the section hyperbolic tangent squared. Of that. 
So we can make it look pretty. rewrite the equation um, so this will be x squared this one will be x and uh, de to tau right this is going to be dx uh, we can Put the two tau out here. This is electronic heat capacity. Dx x squared sec squared of x. Okay, so in terms of the number of symbols that we needed to express that, it's not horrible. Um, but I couldn't find that equation, that integral, well, in my table of integrals in my book. So if you had x over here, that's kind of easy, or if you have, that's kind of easy. Um, if you have an, even term, it's not as easy. So anyways, I guess I just have to go to Mathematica. So not surprisingly, um, you know, this whole thing over here, or the whole integral is I squared over six. Multiply it times the total electronic heat capacity is um, squared over three tau. This here states that the energy. And that is equation Hey, I'm back or no? Yeah, we can hear you now. Okay, I don't know what happened there. So this is the electronic capacity. Uh, so that is equation 7.34. So there's no, you know, there's no, uh, Integral is definitely solvable. Uh, the expression that you end up with for the atomic heat capacity is pretty, pretty simple. So um, this integral over here. And so you don't really need like to go for infinity to infinity. Uh, get pretty much. 
much all of them. They're already very close to high school. Just start seeing the temperature change. So let me move quickly to the rest. Um, for the free electron gas, we know that the density of states is 3n divided by 2 um, epsilon. We derived it last time. And so at the Fermi level, we have that. So we can replace the density of states in the equation for the electronic heat capacity. It's gonna be I squared over B tau. Um, Fermi energy. This expression is the regular temperature, the Fermi. So that one is equation 7.37. So the heat capacity of phonons, you know, we looked at it in chapter four with the divide model. Um, we said that it went as the cube of the temperature. So the total heat capacity of a, of a metal at constant volume is going to be uh, gamma tau. So you have a term that is linear in temperature, which is the electronic. This term, the cubic one, is very tiny. It's tinier than the linear. And so the linear term is going to dominate. So instead of looking like that at low temperature, it's going to look like this. So you have the linear and the cubic. The heat capacity is going to look, you know, you can measure these, of course. If you divide by tau, then we can get rid of this one. This one becomes squared. If you plot the heat capacity divided by the temperature, and you plot that against temperature square, 
then this is a linear equation. And the y intercept is gamma. So if you look at figure seven, um, 7.9, the data for potassium. So we have, you know, there's some scattering over here. The equation is 2.1 uh, plus 2.6 temperature squared using conventional temperature. So this 2.1 is equal to D. And you know, if you assume that this is a simple metal and potassium is a simple metal, then um, you know how many uh, electrons you have. It's gonna be about Avogadro's uh, number. And so you can calculate the Fermi temperature or the Fermi energy. So in the case of potassium, it's going to be um, 2.1, although I guess you have to do something with the units to get it right and check. So for potassium, Okay, it's in it's in electron volts. So two point one electron volts. Uh, you could do this for any material, or for any metal. And so, by measuring the low temperature heat capacity, you can find out what is the energy of the most energetic electron in that system. There's another plot um, in there, which is 7.8. Um, I guess I can put it over here. So that one, you have um, the density, so electrons per centimeter cubed. And over here you have the Fermi energy, so they found it like this, but for different uh, materials. So they have they have uh, cesium, rubidium, sodium, and silver. And uh, this straight line, it's n to the two thirds. And so you can see that all these metals follow this relationship very closely. So they're, they're essentially the electron gases. So I think that's, um, that's pretty cool. So if you give me three more minutes, We have this equation. Right, so for the Fermi energy of a free electron gas. So a white dwarf, it's a, um, it's a stellar remnant, um, so you can observe several of them. Um, I guess not with the naked eye, but uh, Sirius B is the, the most famous one, perhaps. And so a white dwarf has the mass, approximately the mass of the sun, but it has the volume of the Earth. So the sun has about 
um, uh, 1.2 times 10 to the 57 um, protons. And so it's going to have about as many electrons. So let's call it electrons. And the radius of the Earth is 1.4 times 10 to the 6 meters. So the volume of the Earth is 1.2, I mean 1.1 times 10 to the 21 meters cubed. And so with this, you can get a density of electrons for uh, the white dwarf. It came up to be 1.1 times 10 to the 36 electrons per meter cubed. So, you know, plugging that in there, we already know what is the mass of the electron, what is um, h bar squared, the Fermi energy of a white dwarf is uh, 6.1 times 10 to the negative 14 joules. We divide by a Boltzmann's constant. And so we get that the conventional Fermi temperature of the white dwarf is 4.5 times 10 to the nine um, Kelvin. So the observed temperature of a white dwarf is of the order of one times 10 to the seven Kelvin. So the Fermi temperature is about two orders of magnitude higher than the temperature of the system. And so even though it is pretty darn hot, uh, the electrons are much more energetic. And so the electrons form uh, a free electron gas in the ground state uh, in white dwarfs. So in regular metals, you have a Coulomb interaction and attracting the, uh, the electrons to the ions. In white dwarfs, you have gravitational um, interaction. You're bringing everything together. Um, but you still have the free electrons. The temperature is too high for uh, hydrogen to exist. So everything is ionized. So you have just a bunch of protons and your, your sea of electrons. So, you know, it's pretty, um, and the, the Pauli exclusion principle is what um, avoids the collapse or preclude precludes the collapse of the white dwarf. It cannot contract more because then you will start to put electrons in the same quantum number. So electrons, I mean, um, metals and white dwarfs are kind of the same thing. All right, um, so I'm gonna stop recording here.